everybody. Uh, I'm Tracy, Director of Content and Curation for Enwell Foundation. And if you don't know about us, we're a media platform and annual symposium focused on generating human-centered innovation for the end-of-life experience. Now, we're not going to get all the way to the end-of-life experience today, um, but it's something that obviously touches my heart dearly. So 10,000 people turn 65 in the US every day, and that's a lot of people, which makes our conversation today particularly relevant. Um, basically, what we want to cover today is what do baby boomers, what do aging baby boomers want and need from healthcare, and how can we leverage digital technology to be best ensure a person's goals and values are met through their entire health journey? Um, just as importantly, how can we develop and deploy digital solutions that enable caregivers to take excellent care of their loved ones and clients without forfeiting their own health, earning capacity, and future. And we're going to hear a lot about how, how tough it is on caregivers. Um, to help us dig into all of this, we've got three exceptional people with us today. Um, we've got Seth. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, we have Seth Sternberg. He's co-founder and CEO of Honor, which was founded in 2014 and is now one of the fastest growing non-medical home care companies in the US. Congratulations. Um, we have Patrick Day. He's vice president of digital health and innovation at Amgen, one of the world's leading biotechnology companies. And Karina Edwards is CEO of Quill, the healthcare joint venture from Comcast, NBC Universal, and Independence Blue Cross, think about those two together, uh, <laughs> whose focus is to help patients and their care caregivers better navigate their health journey. So welcome. Um, rather than ask a fun fact, we thought we would dive right into what is it personally that makes you so passionate about this space? Seth? Uh, so I got interested in how do we help the elderly because my mother picked me up at the airport and was driving me home. This is in West Hartford, Connecticut, for those of you who know it. And she was just driving slowly and I was like, hey mom, why are you driving slowly? And she said, well, driving's harder than it used to be. Mm. So that kind of freaked me out. Um, and then I went into just exploring how do we help the elderly. I come from the tech industry uh, and you know, my industry, the tech industry, has done very, very little around helping the elderly. And I think the neat thing is that you can help a lot more people when you help the elderly. You can help the caregivers, like the paid caregivers, the family caregivers. Mm -hmm. So it kind of has this like radiating ability to help more people if you help this particular segment. Wonderful, yeah. Patrick? So, uh, so I think um, elderly people, all of us have moms <laughs> who can't maybe drive and don't drive. Mine doesn't drive. And if she is, you don't want to be on the road. Uh, but I think what they really want to know is, do you care? Uh, does somebody care? Um, you know, we, I work in a big biotech company. We make incredibly uh, important therapeutics that save lives. But at the end of the day, it's not about just the therapy. It's about how do we go beyond the molecule? How do we surround the therapy? What do we do to tell these people we care about them? And I think that's what this is really about. Uh, we have aging populations here. We have aging populations in JPAC. Uh, China, everywhere where we can get past just the therapy is going to make a difference in someone's life. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for me, it's a combination of personal, but also that notion of, you know, having served the provider side of healthcare for so long and really focused my efforts on enabling care teams with the right information at the right point in time. The shift to consumerism, it really impacts everybody, right? We're in the sandwich generation. We have to be caregivers. Our Parents have to navigate a health system that is a little bit unwieldy. And how do you really help them break it down in turn by turn, step by step instructions to say, what do I actually do next? Where do I go for information and how do I connect with new populations? So for me, it's a new passion kind of getting into the, the, the consumer side and the patient side and the caregiver side of all of this. Great, thank you. Um, so let's just set the stage here a little bit. For the purposes of today's conversation, we're going to define baby boomers as the elderly. Um, that said, <laughs> when it comes to elders, demographics do more to obscure than reveal. I mean, think about our presidential or democratic presidential candidates. Quite a combination of people. Um, what we do know about older Americans is that, over, that Americans over 50 account for $7.6 trillion annually in direct spending and related economic activity and control more than 80% of household wealth. I mean, that's kind of mind boggling to me. What's not obvious from this data is that 10.5% 10, 10 of our elders live in poverty. So, you know, I would just, 
ask us all to keep that 10.5% really front and center when we think about what we're, what we're doing for the future. We also know that people over 55 account for about half of all healthcare spending, which sounds like a lot, right? But much of that is heavily weighted towards the most chronically ill or spent on the last year of life. So let's get started. Um, Seth, you came from Mebo, then Google. Karina, you came from the healthcare IT space, recently in Pravada, then Nuance. And Patrick, before Amgen, you were at Mattel. <laughs> what has surprised you most about working in the aging space? Oh, uh, so, um, I mean, I think it's kind of an interesting term since I'm aging sitting here. Uh, <laughs> um, so, again, we work, um, we're all trying to find ways in which we can make um, the communities a little better. So, you know, in our space, for example, one of the big things we're trying to do is find a way to get to the population, the aging population. So we're doing... Um, we, we live in a phenomenal time. Um, you know, we've got tremendous amount of technology, and I think if we're able to combine some of these technology elements, uh, and we have some very simple solutions that we're doing for our patients, uh, which can really help them understand how they can live better and how they can actually get better, feel better using these treatments. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think from our perspective, and many of our peer companies are trying to do this. They've come to the recognition that while we are a three and a half trillion dollar industry, we are not getting the value that we would expect from healthcare. So we truly need to get beyond just simple healthcare for people. And I would add, just say, don't underestimate the population, yeah. right? The latest Pew Research has shown that 55% of those over 65 have a smartphone. Yep. Um, they engage in um, uh, on the web all of the time. They love their in-home voice assistant. They actually love their televisions, right? This is a population that knows the nightly news uh, and remembers when it was really nightly. So it, it, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very engaged population if you, if you meet them where they are and, and give them mm -hmm. solutions that fit into their lifestyle mm -hmm. and, and are ambient around them. There, there's not a lot of, the, the usability side of this is huge and we'll talk a lot, I think a lot more about yeah. that today. That's great. So a couple of surprises. Um, one is the older you go, the faster it's growing. So everybody likes to say 10,000 a day turn 65. So people over the age of 65 are going to double in the next 25 <clears> years. <throat> but people over the age of 80 are going to triple. And they need more help than people over the age of 65 or between 65 and 80. So that's a surprise. Um, we do not have good paths or good channels to these people who do need help. So, and that goes for everyone. So the older someone gets, the harder it is to access them. Mm -hmm. And that means the harder it is to help them stay healthy or help them get access to services. And so that's really surprising. Um, and then the final one, which like, it's very disappointing, but true, is the amount of straight up like fraud or misinformation mm -hmm. that I see not just from people who are attempting to commit fraud against the elderly, which is one thing. Uh, my mother-in-law recently fell for one of those scams on the phone and she literally lost $10,000 before we got to her. Um, but even companies that you know, are ostensibly well-meaning just putting out fake press releases. So I, I've been surprised at the level of just like not good actors around this space. That's a really important thing to think about, and maybe we can get into that a little bit more. Well, and, and you know, and if I were to be blunt, the fraud stuff that you see is helped along by that pretty large companies have not put into place safety nets. Mm -hmm. Like, no, you can't spend money in that. You can't walk into Target and buy $10,000 worth of gift cards off of two different credit cards in right. five minutes and then have those gift cards be used 100 miles away by someone who was waiting to run into the store and buy it. I mean, that's elder abuse, right? So I, I, I think what we're, what, what we're also getting to is what are people familiar with and what are they not familiar with? And what's interesting about what Karina's doing is that Quill is using a technology, Cable, which was, it's been around in some form or another since 1948. 
So why don't you tell us a little bit about what you're finding using that and how it's helping with patient engagement and the patient journey. Yeah, it, um, so the TV has been around. People design their living rooms around their television, right? And so it's one of those things where it's a place where you can have discussions or share information um, that is a little bit easier to digest and facilitates conversation. And so we are not just the television, we're actually an app, the web, and the TV. Mm -hmm. And as, as patients navigate a journey, well, there's really a step for everybody in there, and there's a place for those different modalities. If I'm going through a hip replacement journey like our patients at Penn Medicine, the TV is a phenomenal thing for pre-exercises, post-exercises, what I'm supposed to do in my home because it's hands-free and easy where the app is really with me where I need it. And so it, it goes back to it's that combination. The second thing that, that, that is unique about Quill is we leverage more so the content expertise from NBC Universal. Mm -hmm. um, the health information is out there, but how do you break it down in really unique ways that are engaging to people, right? People come to the theme parks, people engage in TV, people engage with our characters. And so how do you bring them to life a little bit to engage patients in different segmentations and in different populations to nudge them to that next best thing? Which I think is really important because a lot of the people we're talking about have at least one, if not two or more chronic conditions. And so, so much of what it seems to me you're all trying to figure out is how to help people be compliant, how, how to help people really adhere to the best kind of schedule for their medication, for their exercise, whatever that is. So I think, Karina, if you want to go into that, and then maybe Patrick, you can add on a little bit about that, that would be great. Uh, sure, what we're finding in the population, this population in particular, uh, that first point, don't underestimate them, right? So of the populations right now in one of our pilots, um, the patient demographics are 55 to 80, and 88% of eligible patients are downloading the app. So back to don't underestimate them. They're, they're mm -hmm. willing to engage with technology, and you make it really easy. Uh, they also, they, they, they react to nudges. What we're finding is, right, if you actually, you know, do a notification, if you send them an email, if you send them a text message, that they are absolutely willing to, um, to do nudges. And the second piece is if you engage their support team, more importantly, their care team, like myself as a, as a you know, a daughter in that sandwich generation helping my dad navigate his journeys, right, where I can help support, hey, you know, dad hasn't checked in in a couple days, you may want to give him a call or hasn't checked in today drop them a note. Those are ways to activate so you can make sure that the patient is surrounded, I think, to the point that you made of they're, they're, they're quite alone in some yep. of their journeys, so. Yeah, I mean, so, you know, one of the things we're trying is, um, um, we're trying to find ways in which we can help these patients as well, right? So everything is not extremely high tech, mm -hmm. uh, contrary to what we believe. So we have, for example, a number of patients that are on arthritis, rheumatoid arthritis treatment. And I think if you look at people who take those treatments, they generally start on a treatment and then they, they start to feel better. And when they start to feel better, they drop off. And that's when I think part of the challenge happens. It costs a lot of money for the healthcare system. Mm -hmm. Ultimately, the patient is uh, affected. So we tried something where we simply sent out um, a message reminder via their, their phone, their smartphone, and ask them on a scale of one to five, how do you feel? Um, and what, what we found is each day they got this message, they started to respond about how they felt. And every two weeks we sent them a paper-based, very sophisticated, mind you, paper-based reminder of this is what your patterns look like. And, I, and it remarkable what the adherence levels did for them because they started to feel better when they started to see a uh, a decline from five being the worst to one. And as they started recording that, they started to get better and better about their adherence. So, uh, you know, that's one example. And I have another one where we've uh, created a little re reminder that every two weeks if you're on a treatment, you walk by and it just simply reminds you that you, you need your treatment. So these are not highly sophisticated compared to all the things we're thinking of in the, in the world. Uh, but they're truly focused on this type of patient population. Uh, and I think one of the things that we know is that elderly people might be a little more lonely. Mm -hmm. They might feel a little more isolated. Uh, and that, so I, I kind of wonder, how much do you guys think what you're doing is about something as simple as caring? 
I would ask him to answer yeah. that first. <laughs> he's in the caring business. Yeah. He's in the care business, uh, exactly. Uh, I'm in the <laughs> providing business of getting them to care, and then he cares once I get him to okay. care. Okay. <laughs> So we definitely do a lot of caring every day. Yeah. <laughs> um, so a bit, it's funny, if you ask one of our care pros, um, well, look at their care plans. And one of the things on the care plan is companionship. It's like spend mm -hmm. time with this person. Mm -hmm. But the average care plan probably has about seven or eight items on it. And there's no discernible pattern around like, oh, everybody needs help with food or everybody needs help taking a bath or whatever it might be. It looks really broad. But if you interview the care pro and you say, what do you spend the majority of your time on when you're in the home? They tell you it's just talking to the person. It's literally just being there as a person for them to interact with. And to the point on, you know, we're aging quickly and the older you go, the faster people are aging. Actually, the more likely people are to live alone as they become older. So the kind of social isolation issue is really big and caregiving really helps. So somebody just asked a great question. Well, there's many great questions, but the one I'm going to take right now is, uh, in the age of automation and people losing jobs, how do you train a workforce to serve as caregivers and make them feel like superstars? Um, <laughs> so th that's a big part of what we do, uh, is we find what we call, well, they're paid caregivers, but then we call them care professionals. Mm -hmm. So the first thing you realize when you talk to a care pro and you say, what do you want? They say they want to be treated with respect. And so we created the, the title care professional to signify that they are professionals and not just you know, someone random. And then respect to them means um, simple things like pay me what you say you're going to pay me. Pay me on time. Don't make me negotiate with you. And this is a fascinating one. Please don't guilt trip me. Mm. And then a big part of it is do you have the work and the hours that work for that person's life. So if you're a care pro who's particularly good at, let's say, caring for someone with dementia, but who is allergic to cats, you know, do you have work for me where I can utilize my skill set to like the max? So I would like to care for someone who has dementia, but please don't put me into a home where there are cats where I'm going to sneeze all day and I'm not going to do a good job. Right. So Karina, we have a ton of data about how hard it is for uh, family caregivers to give care. They tend to, lose, they, they tend to lose their own money, their time, their work. So their own health and happiness is kind of impacted by this. What, do you, what are you doing and what do you see people doing that's really helping caregivers both take care of people better but also take care of themselves? Yeah, it's a great question. So I, I believe the caregiver, back to the underserved population, so you have professional caregivers. We're really saying surrounding a person is a network of support team members. And how do you activate them? But when you activate them, give them the understanding of what it means to be a caregiver. Give them the education that they might need to say, this is very stressful, it's okay to not engage every single day. It's okay to walk away when they ask the question the 50th time. And, and what to do and the tools and techniques to actually um, think through how they, they deliver a best experience to the person they're caring for, but also help themselves and their own families and navigate all of it. So sometimes it's simple tools. Sometimes it really is just with my own uh, dad's health journey. Literally, the, 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 the message I was sharing earlier was, I got a call. I was in California. I might live on the East Coast. Uh, my dad calls and says, don't worry. I'm fine. I'm just going to go in for heart surgery tomorrow. And I was like, what? <laughs> No, no, there's no heart surgery tomorrow. Let's, let's talk about this. And, and back to the tools I had at my disposal, he went to, unfortunately, in Boston, the wrong health system where his cardiologist was directly across the street. And it was log into that portal, log into that portal, start calling care team, and, and really getting that tool set. So now if I can, can preload that to someone that's willing to pay for tools and help organize my dad's information in one place so I know who the care team is and I'm able to give that call, Quickly, I can reduce, reduce my anxiety Got as it. a caregiver in that process. Yeah. So we're getting a lot of questions about caregivers. So I'm just curious, how many people in this audience are caregivers or have been caregivers? And guys, don't be shy. It's uh, up to 50% of, of millennial caregivers are men. So this is not unusual. I think we're going to see that more and more. Um, I think I saw a, a significant number of hands. Well, thank you all. We know how hard it is. 
and I'm hoping that to get collectively this group's helping to make it better. Um, so, Seth, you're kind of the resident expert on this. Thinking beyond what Honor's doing, I mean, what are you seeing in terms of the real challenges and opportunities in elder care, in home elder care? Yeah, so, um, you know, we're really bad at really simple things today. Mm -hmm. uh, so an example would be uh, traditional non-medical home care can help someone do something as complex as like get out of bed when they need to get out of bed with a lift, right? Or take a bath, which is actually very, very hard to do, right? If you need a lift to like get into the bath and wash yourself or whatnot. Um, but there's some simple things like, what do you do when a light bulb burns out? How do you replace the paper towels? How do you make sure the milk is fresh, right? And so you walk into these homes and it's like, oh my God, this person's got like all Insta noodles, right, in the pantry. So I think the opportunity um, is actually to go really simple, right? And to think about how do I just care for the environment in which this person is, which is actually the home. Mm -hmm. And by caring for their home more broadly, you're actually caring for them really well. So I think that's, in a weird way, one of the most basic, most underserved opportunities. That makes sense. Patrick, you're, you're doing something really kind of interesting to me, which is blending both the in, inward-facing IT and then the outward-facing digital health technology. So how, what, do you think this is going to kind of transform Amgen as, as you, know, you start to bring these, care, these concerns into the company? Yeah, so I, I, I think we are going through a fundamental transformation in the healthcare, including many of our peer companies, mm -hmm. because I think uh, a lot of our therapies are geared to certain age populations. I mean, you know, uh, we do oncology and cardiology. Uh, you know, I personally take an Amgen therapy, so I can tell you uh, what happens once you get on the therapy and the process you go through and how they reach out to you and want to talk to you and ask you if you're doing the things you need to do to, to go through this. So I think what we're trying to do as a biotech company is find ways in which we can make the life of an individual, a life of a human being better uh, so they can live longer and healthier lives. And I firmly believe uh, sitting here today with all these great technological minds out there that we are very close to finding more and more ways in which we can use, you, you mentioned the term data. Uh, data is the single biggest asset most of our companies have now. In, mm -hmm. in our company, we have some of the best genetic data. So we're trying to use our genetic data, the phenotypic data, find the confluence of these two to really see how we can change the way uh, human beings live um, and ultimately, do they feel like someone cares beyond just selling them a drug? And I want to build off of your, your response to connect the two. If you start thinking about some of the high-tech simple solutions we can start putting in place. Uh, back to the, we had a, a, a discussion about sensors. And this notion right now, right, the sensors that can be in the home, and you know, Comcast is one example of, uh, today they're the largest internet provider and you know, that's in, 30 million homes, and so when you think about what you can do with an ambient sensor that goes into the home, and now to empower the caregivers, we've interviewed caregivers that have literally made their own apps up. They use Find My Phone and Find My Friends, and they do all of these technologies just to understand, is mom, dad, mm -hmm. grandmother, grandfather, are they doing the same patterns? Are they in the same location? Are they moving around the same way? And just a simple nudge of like, hey, dad seems to be slowing down. You may want to text him today. Now, it kind of reduces your guilt, but also makes sure that there's someone always watching and there to catch if something does happen. So I think mm -hmm. the sensor world is something that's going to I be a game changer. I absolutely love it. Um, and I would add that one of our big themes at Amgen is partnerships. Uh, we are very actively involved with academic institutions, health centers, uh, many of the tech companies out here uh, trying to find ways in which we could use those kind of elements to broaden the, the use of it. I, I want to add something to this. So um, one thing that's really important about technology is to not get stuck 
thinking about technology only as a thing that users can see with their eyes, mm -hmm. like what's on a screen or a sensor under a bed or a camera that's watching, but to think about what technology can do when it's like hidden. Mm -hmm. So you can use really like awesome machine learning style technology to figure out how to give a care pro the kind of work they want, which makes them happier Mm -hmm. makes them less likely to churn, which creates more consistency between that relationship between the care pro and the elderly person, which makes the elderly person happier, which makes the kid happier, which reduces the cost to serve the entire group of people, which creates more efficiency. Got and it. you're doing it through ML, and you never see that technology. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. But it's actually Great. some of the most powerful technology you can do. Yeah. So think about what you can do to kind of shape human behavior on the server and not just what you see with your eyes. So that's, there's a lot of questions that I think are all kind of, centri kind of central, centralizing, <laughs> clustering around. The idea of the home becoming, at least towards end of life or with harder disease issues, the home becoming, in a sense, an extension of the hospital. Mm -hmm. And you know, I think all of you, I'd love to hear your thoughts on how we can both help people who are now kind of doing jobs that might once have been done in a hospital by somebody who'd been trained, and also are there ways to be thinking maybe backwards about how hospitals could feel more like homes? I guess I'll, I'll jump in and say, on this notion of the hospital at home, it, it's personal, right? Not every individual. So I think it's really the first thing you have to understand is, what does the individual want? Mm -hmm. how, do you, how do you bring that individual's personal preferences to bear versus making it this blanket statement of everybody wants to be in their home longer? Yeah, some people do, but some people have high anxiety and some people would love to know that they have a care team member available. Mm -hmm. So that's why I think you're seeing this, this um, growth of retirement communities and over 55 communities and new ways of living and, and, and more that, that communal approach to connecting with people. So a lot of this is very personal. I don't think it's just, there's not one size fits all of any of this. Great, yeah. that's a great point. So, and I would add that I think, uh, I'll go back to my point of data. So as you sit here today, a lot of uh, even older people are wearing you know, Fitbits and things like that. And it gives us a chance today to turn that information much more personal because we learn so much more about the individual that we can uh, start to get more personalized about how they want to live, how they want to be treated. So there, but there are concerns about there are. the digitization of data. That's right. And, and what, what do you think is being done to help protect people um, both in the, re in the real sense of privacy protection, yeah. but also to help people trust the areas that, that are, in your, you know, from your point of view, pretty well protected already. Yeah, I mean, so f where we sit, first and foremost, the privacy and the ultimate security around a patient is first and foremost. Mm -hmm. uh, there are a lot of very strict guidelines. That doesn't mean people don't go around it. I think he gave some very vivid in, uh, uh, issues around what just happened with you know, someone getting a phone call, and these kind of yeah. things are going to happen. But as an industry, I think there are more and more stringent guidelines to protect the person and the individual and the patient. Um, you know, I can't speak for every industry, but um, there's no doubt where we sit, it is very, very heavily uh, first and foremost. We don't, um, you know, our, our CEO likes to say we don't have guardrails that allow us to go on either side of the guardrail. We literally march right in the center. We don't go on either side of a guardrail. Mm -hmm. We go right down the middle, so. That's well, great. And our belief is truly that, that, that the patient owns their data, yeah. right? The consumer owns their data and they have the right to consent who gets to see that data. They have yep. the right to share that information and you have to make that transparent to them. And, and I think that's part of this, you know, who are the good actors, bad actors, how do you do that? That, that, that I think will evolve over time, but it's a critical component here that I have to be able to direct my care teams to be able to see my information. Yep. So one thing I would just want to make sure we're like thinking about when we talk about data at scale, um, you can collect 
aggregate data and draw really fascinating insights mm -hmm. by collecting the aggregate data, right? So it's, it's depersonalized, but it's like, hey, I have figured out that this kind of person, um, let's use care pros. Care pros in San Francisco, on average, will drive up to 18 miles before they're twice as likely to churn in the th first 30 days of taking an appointment. In LA, it's 25 miles. So you collect all this data up, you aggregate it, you create the decay curves, you come up with that insight. And now every other care pro in those markets benefits from that insight. And then you can start micro splicing the data and you can say, oh, well, if the care pro is coming from like this region within the area, it's like this many miles and that region is that many miles. So if you take, like people are really scared of showing their data and individually they should be. But in a group context where you can like look for really big patterns, and then make individuals the beneficiary by looking at their individual data and like applying, making the world better for them based on who they are. You're not outing anyone, right? But you're giving individuals a much better experience because mm -hmm. they are benefiting from the insights of the group. So one of my favorite authors, William Gibson, has said that the future, the, the, the future is out there already, I'm paraphrasing, but it's just, just not very evenly distributed. So what are we doing to, you know, what, what, what are you all doing to ensure equity and access? The, well, the one thing I can share is that it's out there. Um, Comcast does offer Internet Essentials. And so from uh, Medicaid populations, right, they can get Internet access for $9 a month. And so it brings affordability to connectivity because the world we live in today is becoming a much more connected experience. And mm -hmm. so it's one aspect of there's many social determinants, but that's one. Yeah, so again, as a, as a company that provides absolutely amazing, life-changing therapies, you know, our first and foremost um, objective is to make sure that the patient gets treated. Uh, there are a number of ways in which they can get access to the therapy, um, many of which I'm not qualified to speak about because I'm not in the access area. But if anybody has a question and wants to know how to get access to therapy, talk to me after this and I will connect you with the right people. You should never feel like you cannot get access to good therapy. Um. I think they're around, so home care is really expensive at its mm -hmm. base level, like really expensive because you're caring, you're paying for someone to come to your home and serve your mom and that's one-on-one -on -one and expensive. So there are three things you can do. Uh, you can try to device integrate. Mm -hmm. um, the challenge with device integration is that uh, the devices aren't good enough yet and they're not synced with the humans well enough yet and the humans don't have enough density yet. So like you wanna to get to a world where basically someone's sleeping in their bed and there is no care pro in the home, but then they almost have a hospital like call button in their bed and a care pro just shows up within 15 minutes. That would be awesome. Everyone would save so much money. We're not there yet, but it's a possibility in the future. Um, second thing is people are really getting into house, house sharing, right? So house sharing amongst the elderly is becoming a real thing. You can also imagine just sharing care in general more broadly, so that's a huge opportunity area. But then I would say that you have to be careful about negative externalities when you look at this stuff. So we experimented with allowing for just one hour of care at a time, which obviously reduces the cost of care really substantially. But what we found is families would pay for one hour of care, but in that hour, you had to like help dad get out of bed, change his briefs, give him a shower, give him food, and it was not possible to do within an hour. And the families were kind of like, great, I've paid for care, dad's being taken care of, but the care pros could not get it done within an hour. Mm -hmm. And so they actually would like refuse to leave the home. And so we determined that we actually had to shut that service off because it was ending up making care worse for dad, basically because the family was like, dad's taken care of, it's okay, but actually he wasn't getting enough care. So like they're awesome opportunities, mm -hmm. but we have to make sure we get them right and don't go like headstrong into them without looking at what the actual social impact is. Great. We only have uh, four more minutes. So um, I think one of the sort of elephants in the room is ageism. Um, tech doesn't do so great around ageism. And I'm just wondering, what, what are you all doing? Do you have people working on your teams who are the appropriate age? Do you have uh, 
Are you out there talking to people? What's, what's your kind of workaround as, as I hope you're bringing more older people into your workplaces? Yeah, we do a lot of ethnographic research, so um, being able to use that content and understanding and, and going into and observing, uh, so really like understanding the environment that we're plugging into, understanding uh, the needs of those populations because it's not a demographic, it's actually their persona and building out those personas in unique ways and age is only one component of it. I know a lot of young people who hate tech, I know a lot of old people who love tech, right? So you can't put people, we don't fit into the traditional stereotypes and so building out those personas specific to personalization is one of the keys that we're driving towards. Yeah, I mean, same thing. So, I mean, we have, um, you know, we have a lot of talented people in the company uh, around our data scientists are certainly at a certain age bracket where none of us are sitting today. <laughs> uh, but that's what they bring. They bring new skills and elements that we can ultimately use to close some of these gaps. But yeah, I, I think a lot of ours comes from partnerships. We're looking for health centers, academic institutions to help us a little bit to understand some of these demographics and what we can do to really make a change there. So that's excellent. What do you think about your, your external messaging? Because one of the things that really shocked me when I dug into this is that the World Health Organization says that people who perceive aging to be a terrible thing die 7.5 years earlier than people who are OK with aging. Um, I don't know where they found the people OK with aging, but let's assume that they did. <laughs> Um, but what is, it, what is the external messaging, marketing, and design do? Do you, do you think that we're inadvertently and collectively reinforcing stereotypes that we might be able to move beyond, or are we breaking them, or is it a mix? We all know the commercial, right? Help I fall and I can't get up. Right. All right? And they, they, they hated that. People hate that persona. That ad yeah. tested horribly in the demographic they were trying to serve. And I can't even tell you how many times people took off the thing and put it by their bedside. And then they fell in the home. And they had an event. And so uh, you know, I think all the research has shown there was a connected a Digital Health Connected Health Summit that was um, sharing their, uh, their information, and it was, it's the aspirational pieces. It's mm -hmm. the meet them where they want to be. You know, when, when you're not a number. You're, you're, you're Human. trying to live the healthiest version of yourself, and that's going to be different and personal for everybody, but don't, don't, don't belittle me in, in like a, you are an old, frail person. You belong here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, I got a, someone came up to me and said, I have to tell you an honor story. I was going to a wedding on a beach, and there was this like sand bluff that you had to climb to get over to the other, from the road to the other side of the beach. And there was an honor care pro helping one of your customers up over the sand bluff to the wedding on the other side of the beach. That's, That's the kind of story you want to celebrate. Yeah, right. Well, with that, that's, that's a wrap. <laughs> thank you all, and thank you all for the great questions. Thank you. Thank you.